Hi, I'm Matt Mellis. I'm an aerospace engineer for NASA, and I worked on the shuttle program uh, for a good number of years. And I'm here with my uh, colleague today, Kevin Burke, who participated in the acquisition and deployment of uh, the 30 or so clips that you're going to see in just a few minutes. Now, um, and Kevin, thanks for being here today. Glad to be here, Matt. <laughs> Uh, what, what you're going to see is uh, what I consider to be the best of the best state-of-the-art imagery on both film and high-definition video uh, that the Space Shuttle program is capable of producing today. And uh, not only does it serve a technical purpose, um, and we'll get into a lot of that detail as we get into the, uh, the movies here, but it also uh, serves as an enormous inspirational and educational aspect uh, for, uh, for all of NASA's stakeholders. There's a number of intents that we have for this production, and one of them is to pay tribute and commemorate the shuttle program, which has essentially been a 30-year program, and it's nearing completion as we uh, go to final print with this production. We also want to pay tribute to the men and women that made all of this imagery possible over the years of different missions and launches that we've had. And also to uh, give a view that not very many people see outside the NASA family of these fantastic pictures that are used largely for engineering purposes uh, and to let everyone on the outside of the NASA family uh, have insight as to, um, to what goes on with the shuttle when it launches. I think this is a very moving uh, set of clips that you're about to see. We're opening here with this uh, somewhat stylized view of one of the launch sequences that actually is going to play out in the in the upcoming clips and uh, I've got a little soft focus on it and uh, thought we would open it up with a, a couple of fun facts about the shuttle. It really is an amazing piece of equipment. It has phenomenal amount of fuel that it burns over the eight minutes uh, during its trip to orbit and when they get up there um, in that short eight minutes they're going about five miles a second which is a pretty spectacular achievement for a piece of machinery. So uh, this is how it all happens. This is how the, the, uh, the machine does its job and uh, the film speaks volumes. Uh, this uh, is camera view E19. Uh, we commonly refer to this as Echo 19. And it's a 16 millimeter camera with a 10 millimeter um, field of view for the uh, lens, the focal length of the lens. And it's running at 400 frames a second. Uh, so the effective shutter speed is really 1 1 12 hundredth of a second. Yeah, that's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, this is all a slow motion event. Uh, and basically, you're going to see the six seconds prior to launch of the vehicle uh, as the space shuttle main engines turn on. Now, the purpose of this camera. Uh, they all have different purposes. These, most of these, uh, if not all of these cameras that you're going to see in this production are engineering uh, cameras to look for different engineering aspects of, of the launch process. And so the purpose of this one is to check to make sure ignition is going off okay, which is what you're seeing here. Main engine start is just happening and you can see the engines are starting one at a time. Uh, this particular camera looks at uh, engines number one and three, right? Is that what this is? Yep. And, um, and so you can see them they're starting to fire up. Uh, those sparkers that you see are, are there to make sure that any unburned hydrogen gets ignited before it floats around and collects in some place where it can ignite later and cause problems. Uh, again, you're seeing the engine sort of turn on here. And so uh, we're roughly coming into about five seconds before liftoff. The computers are checking and validating that everything's A-OK. -okay. And uh, there's a little bit of a, of, of a pitch over that the whole vehicle does as a consequence of these, these engines thrusting off the center of gravity. And when the whole vehicle snaps back and is straight up in the air, uh, the engines uh, or the uh, boosters ignite and the whole thing takes off. Great, great photography here. I mean, you can see all this flow phenomenon going on inside the engines. Now, the spatial main engines are burning hydrogen and oxygen. And I'll talk about some of the fun facts about that later on in some of the other clips that you're going to see. But here you can see the engines have stabilized and uh, everything is A-OK. -okay. And uh, in just a few moments, you'll see the boosters fire off. Um, did we talk about the time code? I can't remember. So, mm -hmm. it, No, we, we haven't talked about the time code. The time code uh, that you'll see, uh, the LED display on the right-hand side, is actually positioned between the two sprockets um, 
on the 16 millimeter frame. And uh, the timecode is UTC timecode. It's an IRIG B format. And you'll see that it's uh, 21 hours, so being UTC at 5.02 p.m. local time. Uh, two minutes, 11 seconds. And the uh, three uh, digits that are moving in the upper right-hand corner uh, would be representing a thousandth of a second. The solid number one, um, the second digit from the top, is uh, indicating the synchronization of the camera as, as more of a technical parameter. Um, and that is uh, on every camera to synchronize the field of view, to syn synchronize the time. This is pretty cool. You can see the, some of the oxygen, that, that cloud of uh, vapor there was from the oxygen uh, fuel umbilical. Uh, of course, the solid rocket boosters have now uh, ignited and the whole vehicle is lifting off the pad. And uh, you can see sort of the glory of this moment. I mean, there's an enormous amount of fuel being burned. Uh, one little thing that I love is if you look at the sky in the background, and this was a very clear day. These pictures were, were selected or these in, uh, movies were selected because of the, the, the wonderful photography that we got on this day. And you can see the sky deep into this dark blue. And that's because, as, uh, as Kevin will talk later on, that we got into a uh, color correction that we do post-launch uh, post to make sure that we're capturing all of these, uh, uh, the events that are going on, all of the flow events. So here the vehicle is uh, clearing the pad and um, we're, we're on our way. This view that you're seeing here is, uh, is camera E8 or Echo 8, and it's a 16 millimeter camera with uh, a 10 millimeter lens. Yeah, you can see the boosters now coming off the pad. And uh, one of the amazing things that a lot of folks don't know about the shuttle is bolted to the mobile launch platform is it's basically through four bolts on each solid rocket booster. And the intent of these cameras is to watch that bolt, which is an explosive uh, nut bolt arrangement. And uh, the bolt weighs about 100 pounds, I should say. And uh, these nuts fracture and the bolts uh, slap down into a holder that you're actually sort of seeing in the foreground here. And they literally release the vehicle from the pad and allow it to, uh, to take off. So for obvious reasons, we have a camera on each one of these explosive uh, hold down posts and uh, to make sure that they're operating, uh, they're a critical aspect to the launch process. We want to make sure that they're operating good. So you can see that puff of smoke coming out. And actually, if you want to put the uh, remote on a frame by frame uh, stop uh, action, you can actually see the flash as it explodes. Uh, now, Kevin, here, here's where you guys really did a fantastic job of, of uh, capturing the, the detail in the plume through this automatic aperture on the cameras. You want to talk about that a bit? Sure. Uh, many of the 16-millimeter uh, cameras that are on the MLP and pad structure have a, an automatic exposure control. It's the only real way to, to keep the, uh, the exposure, uh, the high dynamic range exposure from uh, pre-ignition of the SRBs uh, through, through the, uh, the liftoff out of the frame of view. Uh, so the camera has a basically an automatic exposure. Right. Now look at the sky on the left uh, thing and see how it gets dark actually on both sides. You can see how it turns that deep blue. That's the automatic aperture in action right there, right? Allowing it to see the detail in, yeah. the, in the pad structure and also in the flame. Yeah. I mean, it, when you see a launch in real life, you, the, the, you can't see any detail with the naked eye in the plume. It's just like looking into the, the sun almost. It's so bright. We can see some of the water from the launch pad. There's a cooling water that comes out. We'll talk about that later that's splashing onto this quartz. Uh, protective glass that the cameras behind. Of course, they're in these explosion-proof uh, containers, right, to keep, to keep the cameras safe and sound. The, uh, no yeah. cameras were harmed in this uh, in the making of this movie. <laughs> That's right. The cameras are in an explosion-proof box, uh, which is nitrogen purged, and uh, the quartz glass on the front protects the lens. Um, in in most cases, there are some cases where there's damage, and if that's the case, the lenses will be repolished, reground, or or whatever's necessary to bring them back into optimal condition. Well, at this uh, next view coming up is uh, Echo 18 or Camera 18, and it's a 10 millimeter lens uh, and looking at the TSM or the uh, tail service ma mast uh, carrier disconnect. Yeah, the, the umbilicals, uh, there's one on each side of the orbiter, one for the liquid oxygen fueling and one for the liquid hydrogen fueling. Those are primary purposes. You can see there's a lot of other instrumentation on these things uh, in feed lines. But uh, these cameras, their intention is to make sure we get good retraction of this, and there's actually uh, a huge 20,000 pound mass that pulls these things inside the tail service mast uh, for the door to slam shut and protect them from the, um, the hostile environment on the outside. Now these umbilicals are about four feet wide by six foot tall, so you don't really get a sense of scale when you're looking at these in these movies, uh, but they're as big as, a, as an average size human being, so they're um, quite large. 
One of the uh, interesting photographic challenges that we run into in uh, photographing uh, the uh, TSM carrier disconnect from the inside of the uh, tail service mast is once that door closes, it's pitch black in there. So there's a set of uh, series of uh, tungsten lamps that provide illumination. And the vibrations, the tremendous amount of vibrations that are in induced during the, uh, the, during the liftoff uh, really rattle those uh, lights and keeping them um, from uh, having those bulbs break is, is, has been quite a challenge. In fact, uh, they are in the process of uh, changing those lights over to uh, the new LED arrays that provide um, more stability and uh, less uh, frequency of um, having the bulbs go out um, before the film yeah, runs they're, out. They're a lot more robust to that kind of environment. Okay, Matt, this is uh, Echo 001, um, and this is uh, one of the four cameras on the edges of the MLP deck. This is on the this camera happens to be on the northeast corner of the MLP deck, and it's a 16 millimeter camera, as all the ones on the MLP are, and 10 millimeter focal length. It's a wide angle view, and the effective shutter speed is about one twelve hundredth of a second. For our viewers, uh, you can see that we pulled a little bit away uh, back from the vehicle. Now we're taking a little bit of a wider view. There's the SSMEs just firing off there, and you can see the plume in the background uh, growing. In fact, if you look carefully uh, against the plume there, you can see a couple of cameras. Um, why don't you mention what those are, Kevin? Yeah, those are some MoTV cameras, operational television cameras that are used for surveillance of the of the vehicle. They're, they they uh, and are piped back live to the uh, launch control complex. The signals. So the SSMEs are firing. You can actually see the launch tower on the right hand side of the screen. And uh, again, they go on for about six seconds. Computers are making sure that everything's working. And at uh, T minus zero, those boosters are gonna fire and uh, you'll see a big puff of smoke come out of the flame trench there and it'll get sucked back down in uh, as the boosters come off the pad. And these two sort of uh, structures, uh, one standing just to the left of the left booster and one standing just to the right of the right booster are called rainbirds and uh, there's some piping uh, sort of flat against the launch pad as well that sort of connect all these things together. There, there go the boosters firing. And uh, all of this fresh water, 300,000 gallons to be exact, uh, comes pouring out of those rainbirds and uh, onto the launch pad to deaden the acoustic noise and cool the pad down. So that's where the water comes from in some of these camera shots. And here you can see the, uh, the AEC, um, the automatic exposure control on the cameras uh, taking over as the uh, the booster uh, plume uh, comes into view and allows to see um, the AEC allows you to see the, um, the detail both in the plume as well as in the uh, vehicle and the structure itself and you can also see very good detail on the, the deck of the MLP. Now uh, we talk a little bit about the purpose of each one of these cameras and um, this one is to look for some structural anomalies uh, on the vehicle, some thermal uh, insulation failures we might have on the tiles or the blankets etc and uh, how the water is getting dispersed on the pad and also we're looking at uh, debris and actually you can see here that we've got quite a bit of debris in the field and debris is a big concern for the shuttle folks and we want to keep an eye on it to make sure we don't have anything that's going to threaten the vehicle. Now Matt you can see that this is a uh, well this is camera Echo 4 uh, E004 it's on the uh, corner of the MLP deck and uh, very similar in field of view to uh, the camera we just looked at. Uh, what One of the things I like to point out is you can see one of the camera box enclosures we were talking about a little bit earlier uh, in the left hand side of the frame right in front of the, uh, the left SRB. Yeah, and in fact, uh, uh, as we mentioned earlier in the, uh, in the piece, there's about 125 cameras or so, actually more, uh, that document any given launch. And so for brevity in this piece and to make it watchable, we had to have a lot of, a lot of film hit the cutting room floor and it was really difficult for me to to cut a lot of it out because I loved all of the footage. I, I'm, I'm a fan of each and every camera, uh, but that little camera there didn't get its, uh, its day in the shade. That, that, uh, that film of the booster had to, uh, we'll have to have that for the director's cut in the future. <laughs> and uh, just to give you a perspective, um, this camera uh, originally captured the scene at uh, 400 frames a second. So it's being played back at uh, 24 frames. So it's about 1 16th, uh, uh, of the speed um, that it was actually captured at um, to give us a real-time view. Now you, you can see here how absolutely gorgeous the day was and as we mentioned earlier it was about five o'clock in the afternoon so in the film industry they call this magic hour and, and there's no question about it that this is one of the best times of day to take photographs of the shuttle. You have these rich colors and uh, just a beautiful blue sky 
uh, to sort of highlight all of this. So um, I, I find these pictures second to none in all of the launch imagery that's been taken. I should say that these boosters uh, shed about 10,000 pounds of mass per second once they're lit up. Uh, and that's each, so it's 20,000 pounds combined. And you can really get the feel of, of uh, that awesome magnitude by looking at these images. There you see a piece of debris in the right, sort of doing a ballet in, in uh, slow motion there. This is some tie down string from some water membranes under the SRBs that we'll talk about in a few moments. You know, teams go through this, uh, this is engineering footage, and the teams go through this and identify everything they see in it. Okay, this, uh, this is uh, camera Echo 36, and this, is, uh, this camera is located on the fixed service structure at the 255 foot level. Uh, we refer to the fixed service structure as the FSS. It's a 16mm uh, camera uh, with a 16mm uh, uh, focal length lens. And the effective shutter speed is about a 12 hundredth of a second, similar to some of the other ones that we've seen. Um, this is a long clip. Um, in fact, this is probably the longest clip uh, that, that I sort of chose for the, uh, the production. There's a lot going on in here, but it looks a little boring for a while because those engines are on for a long time. So we're still at 400 frames a second here, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. So there you see the main engines igniting. You can see all of this water pouring into the flame trench. There, there's a the big flash, uh, the hydrogen and the oxygen lighting up. I should tell you that uh, coming out of that external tank, uh, inside there are the cryogenic propellants, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. 750 gallons a second of liquid hydrogen is pouring into that engine cluster and 280 gallons a second of liquid oxygen. All of these uh, things being combined uh, instantly, uh, effectively instantly, to, uh, to create this fantastic combustion process, burning 3,000 pounds of um, propellants to turn it into water vapor every second. And it's almost invisible when it comes out of the engines. So the engines are, are turning on now, and you can sort of see them glowing against the water pouring into the flame trench. That water's there uh, primarily to deaden the acoustic noise and to keep things cool. Um, and you've got a good look at the belly of the orbiter here. One of the purposes of this camera is to look to see if we lose any tiles uh, due to the shock of, of ignition of the solid rocket boosters. Now, you're going to see the boosters turn on in just a couple of minutes, and you see those red sort of ribbed uh, surfaces there inside the, the flame trench. Those are actually um, membranes to hold water, and those will get burned away, and you'll sort of see that in the film when the boosters fire. And there you see them right there, and there's water in there that's sort of uh, that's sort of getting jarred loose and turning into steam. Uh, and, I, and I'm assuming, I don't know for sure, that it, it prevents uh, sort of a recirculation of the exhaust at liftoff. Probably, again, uh, acoustic deadening noise. And there you see those boosters firing off. If you look in the upper uh, left-hand corner, you see the, um, uh, the umbilical uh, falling backwards there. And then look at how the uh, space shuttle main engines are punching through that, that, uh, that water in the flame trench. That's really cool. Yeah, that is, it is quite a dramatic shot. And the, uh, you can see the uh, auto exposure control on the, uh, on the lens, as we've talked about um, on some of the other views, really helping to be able to see the detail on the, uh, the SSMEs uh, punching that hole, as well as looking at the plume from the, for the, from the SRB um, and seeing the, uh, the edge of the, uh, the belly of the orbiter, too. See, the, the SSMEs aim a little bit off uh, kilt there, and you can see them hitting the, uh, the upper part of the mobile launch platform as they rise off. Amazing that they capture all that detail in the, S uh, the SRB plumes. It's good stuff. It's a fantastic clip, it, it, you know, yeah. it really is. This is a uh, camera Echo 41. This is on the fixed service structure on the FSS at the 255 foot level. It's a uh, 10 millimeter focal length on the 16 millimeter camera. It's a really interesting view and you know, Matt, you want to provide some more details about what we're seeing. Yeah, you can see the boosters have already fired in this big uh, umbilical structure that you see swinging back. Uh, it's actually very massive. The plate on the end of that is about a foot and a half by three foot uh, square. You'll see a close-up of that in a little bit. That's the, uh, the uh, ground umbilical to uh, hook up to the, uh, the venting for the hydrogen tank, and, and it's got some uh, nitrogen and helium purge lines and some instrumentation that go with it. 
a pretty complicated structure. You get a picture of that in a minute. If you look at the MLP or the mobile launch platform, you see all the water coming out of the rainbirds under the launch pad. And again, our active uh, exposure uh, kicking in there and giving us a great shot of the plumes as the vehicle clears the tower. If you look on the right, you can just see a tad of the SSME uh, burning there, that little blue cone. Fantastic detail there, isn't it? Yeah, it's a great shot. Echo 40 is one of my, my favorite shots, Matt, and this is on the, uh, the fixed service structure on the FSS at the 275 foot level, just a bit higher than the two previous um, uh, views we, we saw. And this is uh, really an incredible view of uh, not only the orbiter, but the, uh, the beautiful ocean, the late spring day in Florida, and very nice lighting uh, on the tank, and uh, as well as you'll see on the orbiter surfaces. Yeah, it truly is a magic hour on this. Uh, that orange tank, for those that aren't all that familiar with the shuttle, that's foam. That's insulating foam on the tank to keep the cryogenic propellants cold on the inside. Uh, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen are pretty chilly when they get into their liquid state. Uh, you can actually virtually look into the cockpit here. If you look carefully, you can see the ocean right through the window, just briefly there for a moment. Kind of fun. Uh, there's discovery in all its glory. This, this uh, engineering view is to look at uh, any possible issues with the tiles or the thermal protection system on the vehicle. And uh, look at that, absolutely gorgeous. You can see some of the flakes of ice sort of tracking the vehicle as it moves upwards. Remember, uh, as we mentioned earlier, that 3,000 pounds of water vapor a second is coming out of the uh, space shuttle main engines on the back. It's pretty incredible and it's virtually invisible. All right, this view is of, uh, of a structure we call the GUP, which is the uh, ground umbilical carrier plate, which attaches to the ground umbilical carrier assembly, sometimes called the GUCA. That plate is about a foot and a half by uh, three foot. It's a sizable plate. You don't really capture the scale in this, and you can see the vehicle is now lifted up and it's taking off. That umbilical peels back right at uh, solid rocket booster separation or uh, detonation. And Matt, this is uh, camera 33, and this is at, on the FSS. It's at the 235-foot uh, level um, and is using a uh, fairly long uh, focal length lens. It's, uh, and you can tell by the field of view that it is a long focal length lens, and it's 75 millimeters. Now, if you look, you can see the booster's kind of surging. It's not a continuous uh, pass. It sort of pushes and then slows down a little bit. And what you're seeing there is the natural frequency of the booster thrust um, I believe it was on the order of about seven hertz, uh, seven cycles a second, and you can see that go by and hear the, uh, the aft skirt of the boosters going by with a really nice tight shot of the, uh, the exhaust. This camera view is uh, on the pad perimeter. It's located at camera site three. It's about 1,273 feet away from the, uh, from the vehicle. And it's the first in a series of the 35 millimeter cameras, which we'll be seeing in the upcoming uh, sequences. Uh, there's a lens on here. The focal length is 500 millimeters or so. And the effective uh, exposure um, is a 1 450th of a second. And the camera's running at 180 frames per second. Yeah, it's a beautiful shot, and uh, this is going to, as uh, Kevin said, it's first in the 35 millimeter shots. They're a little better quality uh, because they've just got more surface area to put an image on. Um, you can see the SSMEs firing and uh, all in nominal operation here. And uh, as soon as they pull away from the pad, you'll see the left booster in the background uh, centered between the two service tail masts. And just a gorgeous uh, shot right there, looking at the steam coming off the SSMEs. And uh, this is a fantastic uh, capture of what, what remains behind after the vehicle clears the towers. You have all of this water and steam 
uh, being pushed around in this amazing uh, hostile acoustic environment. I mean, look at what's going on there. This is all acoustic noise and, and shock uh, coming from the boosters and the SSMEs. Camera 63 is uh, located on the pad perimeter, uh, one of the camera sites. It's uh, 1,270 feet uh, from the vehicle, and it's using a 105 millimeter lens. The uh, camera's running at 180 frames a second, and that's pushing about 630 feet of film through the camera uh, per minute. Uh, quite, quite, a, quite a fast rate, uh, especially for 35 millimeter. Yeah, you can see the spark is going there, just getting ready to turn uh, the main engines on. And uh, in the background, you see the water tower. That's where all that fresh water comes from to flood the pad, to keep it chilled and deaden uh, a lot of that acoustic noise that we've already seen uh, what it looks like uh, in the plume. Uh, absolutely gorgeous day, really accentuated by this shot. Blue sky in the background. Goes great with the, uh, the white exhaust plume coming out there. And uh, you can see a lot of splashing and uh, stuff jetting out from all different directions at the bottom. You'll see more of that in the shots that are coming up. Uh, th this shot is going to be the first uh, of a, a bunch of different views as we march counterclockwise around the pad to look at it from different angles. And uh, there you can see the boosters have fired and you see it all coming out the other side of the flame trench. And uh, beautiful shot of it coming off the pad. And the lighting at uh, 5 o'clock in the afternoon on this uh, late spring day is just about perfect from this camera view. Of course, it won't be perfect uh, for all the views, but uh, certainly is a nice angle and really eliminates the, the vehicle as well as the structure very nicely. Yeah, yeah I like when, uh, when the vehicle leaves. Uh, I left a lot of these shots run long because I thought it was kind of neat to see what happens afterwards. And you can just see the, the whole service structure here being engulfed in steam and, and exhaust from the solid rocket motors. Now one interesting thing about the 30, this particular 35 millimeter format is uh, earlier we mentioned about the time code. And the iRig time code is uh, burned in with an LED display and on the 35 millimeter format it's actually in part of the, the image area because the 35 millimeter format has uh, four sprockets per frame. Uh, so there's no way to position the, uh, the LED um, time code in between the sprockets like we can on the 16 millimeter right, views. Right, so, so if you looked at the, the 16 millimeter, you could actually see the, the sprockets at the top and the bottom of, of each frame, and those aren't visible in, in the 35 as you see here. The, uh, the camera number uh, is on the lower right hand, uh, on the lower right hand display of the LED time code, and it's, uh, in this case it's camera number 62. So the, uh, the 35 millimeter format also allows us to put a, a, de a camera designator number that's uh, fairly often used uh, just to help for uh, viewing purposes and, and tracking purposes. This again is a 105 millimeter lens um, and is on the pad perimeter, approximately 1,270 feet uh, from, the, uh, from the vehicle. Look at, look at the, the, uh, the, the absolute force that all of this stuff is coming out of there. I, I've talked uh, earlier in the piece about how much is coming out of the solid rocket boosters, 20,000 pounds uh, combined, and then the uh, SSMEs are losing 3,000 pounds of uh, liquid propellants a second. And that really shows up here when you're looking underneath the, the launch platform, you can see uh, that all of that stuff doesn't have anywhere to go, which is why it's vectored out on both sides. Uh, so it can be um, sort of safely directed away from the vehicle so there's no uh, rebounding or, or a sort of backflow, so to speak. And one thing we haven't had a chance to talk about uh, earlier is the, uh, how the cameras are triggered. Uh, currently, the, um, the camera's all triggered using the uh, POX, or the photo optical control system, which triggers all the cameras on the pad perimeter on the uh, fixed service structure as well as the, uh, the MLP. And uh, it's quite a sophisticated system um, to synchronize and, and trigger all the cameras uh, based on the launch clock. Yeah, it's undoubtedly uh, a very complex system to have all these cameras operate uh, flawlessly for each launch. They're very important, if not critical, for, for shuttle launches. And um, it's an amazing achievement that uh, all the men and women who, who work on this are able to uh, do it uh, with such a degree of reliability every launch. 
Um, another shot here is, as I said, moving around counterclockwise, you see the SSMEs or the boosters are just firing, excuse me, and there you see the, the gup falling back as we talked about earlier, the uh, umbilical uh, assembly. This view is using the same 105 millimeter focal length uh, lens that the, uh, the other two views we just uh, looked at. And again, is about 1,200 feet from the, uh, from the vehicles where the camera site is located. You know, th this was a really unusual day because you just mentioned earlier that, you know, from not all, from all views is the lighting going to be as good, but this is about as good as it gets. I mean, each and every one of these camera views is well exposed, uh, both from an engineering and a beauty standpoint. Uh, they're all very, very nice shots. And it's why we selected 124 uh, to be the predominant content in this movie. There's the, uh, the uh, water tower, by the way, in the foreground. It's just about to get engulfed with the exhaust. This is a Dog 68. It's a 35 uh, millimeter camera, and it's really uh, uh, intended to be a documentary camera. So it's running at uh, 28 uh, frames per second. Uh, not really a, a high-speed camera, so it's, it's almost real-time, a real-time camera view. It's a, just a really beautiful shot, and uh, because it's a documentary camera, we're able to uh, uh, enlarge the aperture so that the timing block isn't taking up image area and present it in its uh, widescreen view, and I think it's quite dramatic. Yeah, from a, from a beauty standpoint, um, this is probably at the top of my list for favorites. Uh, um, it's just gorgeous quality. Uh, fantastic color saturation and um, very unusual for uh, shuttle photography to be so beautiful uh, at the same time. So Echo 55 begins our series of uh, tracking cameras. Um, Echo 55 is mounted on a Kineto tracking mount or KTM, which we uh, commonly refer to it as. And it's uh, located at CS1, about 1,200 feet uh, from the vehicle. This is a nice shot because you can see uh, there's a bit of a distortion cloud here that we're shooting through. And what that is, is hydrogen being burned off um, from the fueling system. They, they burn off any excess hydrogen uh, to safely combust it. And so that's what we're seeing here. And it's really gorgeous as the vehicle sort of comes out of that and goes into its roll program, uh, clearing the tower. Uh, again, just a fantastically uh, well-lit photograph on this, on this day. Some of the white things that you see falling off there are paper covers, which protect some of the uh, order maneuvering system engines. We'll talk about those later. But Kevin, the, the, these are all manually operated, right? I mean, there are human beings behind the scenes um, doing this tracking now. Yes, this uh, uh, KTM, or the Kinetto tracking mount, has about four cameras that, that are mounted on it. And this particular uh, camera, Echo 55, is one of a pair of cameras um, and is intended to look at the uh, top half of the vehicle, while the other camera is intended to look at the bottom portion of the vehicle. Right, and we'll see that in the next shot. We'll have one of the, uh, one of the views from the uh, bottom of the stack on the next one. In fact, our intent is uh, to have in the deleted scenes on this disc um, uh, a set of camera pair views sort of pieced together so you can see them simultaneously. So look for that in the extra features. This is, this is a, a fantastic, now they're completely uh, done with their roll program and uh, sort of on their way. Yeah, the, uh, the intent of that uh, camera shot is only for the first 1,200 feet uh, of the ascent is uh, really the, uh, the, the intention of that, uh, that view. And that takes about uh, 18 to 20 seconds, I believe. Okay, now this is camera 52. And this, is, of course, is at the bottom of the stack now. So it's a little different view, and uh, but part of a camera pair again. Right. This is this camera is, uh, as you said, is 52, and this is located on uh, camera site uh, two, and is about the same distance, uh, 1,200 feet, uh, 1,270 feet from the vehicle. Nice shot of the SSMEs there. It it always amazes me how transparent the exhaust coming out of the SSMEs is. Now this uh, Kineto tracking mount is, uh, is controlled by an operator, manually controlled by an operator uh, who's sitting in the LCC on the second floor uh, below the firing room. And uh, the person, he or she, is using a, a trackball to uh, track um, the, the vehicle. And it's, uh, it's pretty tricky because they're just looking at a little video monitor 
and uh, the vehicle is moving much faster in real time than we're seeing. We're seeing it at uh, you know, one-fifth the speed in this particular case of uh, what it is in real time. Uh, this Kinetto tracking mount also has uh, HDTV cameras that are uh, mounted that are used for what we'll call quick look, what's called quick look, uh, to look at the, uh, these views in real time and then in near real time uh, you know, when they start the uh, image analysis. Uh, this is done while the film is getting processed and uh, transferred. That was a, a fantastic shot, um, seeing the sun go right in between the two plumes. And in fact, it gives you an idea how bright these plumes are to the naked eye because uh, the sun, as it passed through there, wasn't much brighter than, than, than the plumes that you saw. Wonderful shot showing the column of fire that the vehicle rises on, and it, it really contrasts nicely with the blue. Again, highlighting why STS-124 was, was really the correct mission to, to sort of springboard off of to show all the beautiful film. This is uh, camera 57. This is at uh, CS6, uh, again, 1,200 feet uh, from the pad or so. And we're looking at the bottom half uh, of the vehicle. As I mentioned earlier, the, the camera is mounted on a tracker. A KTM tracker has uh, four or five different cameras on there. And this is the lower half um, uh, film camera looking at the bottom of the vehicle. And you can see the paper covers come off the uh, RCS engines. Those are Tyvek covers, just same same kind of material that you put on your house when uh, building it. And uh, those covers are there in case they get a squall or uh, a little storm while the shuttle's out on the pad. Not uncommon in Florida, and we can't afford to have water inside those engines, so we put those paper covers on there, and they have these little parafoils that inflate, sort of tear the cover off. They're just uh, adhered uh, with an adhesive of some kind. So the, you'll see a lot of that white paper coming off during these launch shots. Beautiful shot looking up the tail end of the, uh, the stack. And uh, possibly on the uh, deleted features or the deleted scenes on this disc, uh, we're going to try to uh, edit a uh, piece together showing this, the camera pair, the views from the camera pairs pieced together. And it should look pretty nice to so look at that on our our uh, deleted scenes uh, feature on the disc. This is uh, Echo 225. As you can see, it's already uh, in flight. It's a really interesting view. It's a medium range uh, tracking camera. Um, the, the mount and the camera are located at uh, UCS-4, which is about 2.4 miles uh, north of the pad. One of the reasons I selected this shot uh, to be included on the DVD is because um, I thought it was really striking and really beautiful how in their roll program as they went into their roll the the sun sort of peaks over like it does here and, and you can see the name pop out and uh, slowly the whole orbiter becomes lit with the uh, with the evening sun and uh, the textures are fantastic here you can see the thermal blankets you can see some of the thermal uh, exposure to the thermal blankets you see some variation in color and you can see the tiles literally make out the uh, the boundaries of the tiles there. So uh, really a wonderful uh, piece of footage and, and uh, a remarkable contribution to the DVD from a photography standpoint. The lens that's on the camera is an 150 inch uh, Bashir lens. It's a cationic uh, lens, uh, so it's got a mirror surface. And it's about 4,000 millimeters uh, focal length uh, if you converted the, the inches to millimeters. Just to give a perspective, Matt, the weight of this lens is about 250 pounds, just the lens itself. It's a huge lens and a really unbelievable piece of optics. You can really see a lot of nice textures on this shot, too, uh, on, the, on the booster. If you look at the, uh, the forward part of the booster, you can see the access panels and um, that big line coming off of the external tank. That's actually the uh, oxygen feed line on the external tank. That's where that 280 gallons a second of liquid oxygen are uh, flowing through to the main engines. That feed line is about 17 inches in diameter, so it's a pretty beefy uh, system. And I think another thing to point out here is that um, this uh, camera mount is uh, manually tracked. So the operator is looking through a bore sight at the camera site, launch vibrations going on all around uh, uh, him or her, and keeping uh, that uh, vehicle uh, dead center in the frame. And it's uh, quite amazing. Um, uh, feet to be able to do that so quite so accurately. Yeah, they, they, uh, they've done a great job of keeping on target every step of the way.
Now they're getting a little further away, obviously, and you can see uh, sort of the glow of those engines starting to come up against the bottom part of the uh, the stack there, as they call it, and um, lets you know that something's going on at the back end of that vehicle. So the next series of uh, shots we're going to see is the uh, views from the HD cameras. And um, in this particular view, this is uh, from STS-114, Return to Flight. So this was uh, in July 26th of uh, 2005. And uh, we're about one, about two miles from the pad, just south of uh, pad 39B here. And the camera is, uh, is cocked at a uh, 45 degree angle to enable maximum use of the uh, 16 by 9 aspect ratio that uh, is uh, available with the uh, HD TV cameras. Now it's important our viewers take a good look into the uh, left window there. You can actually see Eileen Collins who commanded this mission. You can see her suit inside the window. Um, absolutely amazing. Uh, and this is a first, right? This is a first in the program. We started using high definition video after Columbia. Okay. And uh, that was um, uh, one of the first times we saw this level of detail in photography. That, that is correct. So this particular uh, camera view is EHV-225. This was recorded on STS-117. It was in June 2006. And um, the camera is uh, running at 60 frames a second, as all the HDTV cameras uh, do. Um, the, the orientation of the camera is, uh, is cocked at 45 degrees to make maximum use of the aspect ratio of the 16 by 9 frame um, to get as much of the vehicle, um, space shuttle vehicle, in the frame as possible. This particular shot I chose because um, it's well exposed and, and it shows a beautiful uh, sequence in the roll program, but you also get this really nice uh, vapor phenomenon as the vehicle accelerates uh, to higher speeds. And this is not always visible to the, uh, for every launch, is a, it's a consequence of atmospheric conditions, uh, dew point, humidity, etc. So um, I thought it was kind of a nice, uh, nice touch to this particular image. This is the only long range camera that made the final cut and Kevin will give you the details about that in a moment, but I want you to look at the bottom of the tank there. Uh, as you saw, it just sort of uh, became engulfed in flames. And um, you should know that this is a, a, a normal phenomenon in, in a shuttle launch. But what's effectively occurring here is the exhaust gases coming out of the S SRBs and the um, SSMEs are sort of expanding into the higher vacuum as they head into space. And the radiant heat from the expanded plumes becomes high enough to ignite some volatile gases that are caught up in this aerodynamic dead zone, so to speak, at the rear of the tank for a couple of moments during flight. But this is an amazing shot, Kevin, because it's from so far away, so why don't you explain uh, what we're looking at here? Yeah, Matt, the uh, camera here is located at a place called Apollo Beach. It's within uh, Cape Canaveral National Seashore, and the camera mount is about 20 miles north of the pad, so it's quite a distance away. This is a uh, Brashear 150-inch uh, lens, again about uh, 4,000 millimeters. Uh, so quite a, quite a distance, and the uh, tracker, is, as we mentioned earlier, is manually um, operated. So it's an operator looking through a, uh, a scope and uh, using a trackball to keep the, uh, the vehicle in the field of view. It's, yeah. um, it's also difficult for the operator, because of the distance, to see the vehicle at launch to sight the pad. Yeah, it's so just a he has to, tiny point she, of light, right? So. So he or she grabs it on the fly, and it's it's yeah. quite a quite a skill level that's uh, that needs to be developed in order to do that. Well, and of course we watched our solid rocket boosters separate, um, which is uh, sort of at the tail end of what we can see with with all of the tracking cameras. And um, there you see our boosters coming off, and uh, they they separated about 29 miles in altitude, about two minutes into flight, and they are recovered by divers out in the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, although they appear to be falling back here, they're actually uh, traveling another 15 miles or so up, just tumbling on their own forward momentum before they peak and then come back down in the Atlantic about 150 miles out where the diving tanks pick them up and bring them back for refurbishment. So this sort of brings us to the end of our production. Um, hope you guys have enjoyed the commentary. Kevin and I have enjoyed uh, doing it today for you. and. Uh, as the boosters sort of fade out and the, the external tank and the orbiter continue on their way to orbit, we want to dedicate this movie to uh, all of the men and women over the 
30 years of the program or so that have uh, committed themselves to capturing all of these fine images. It's uh, amazing work, uh, it takes a lot of commitment, and it's extraordinarily tough to do so, and uh, our hat's off to them. So Kevin, thanks for doing this with me. Thank you. Um, it's been a, a wonderful endeavor, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll see each other again on the next uh, space program. So, uh, signing off. <laughs>